Monica Price on Copper TV. Today I'm joined by Barry Tomes from Gotham Records, who's previously joined me on the show before, but today he joins me to talk about the record industry and how it makes money. Barry, thank you so much for coming back. Thanks for inviting me back. I'm you're, very surprised to get the invite. You're very welcome. All right. When that letter came through the post, I thought, this is a, you're never coming back. So I was delighted you invited me. Thank you very much. You're very welcome. So Barry, just tell us a, a quick bit about what you're actually doing at the moment. Well, obviously I release records, as we talked about before, but we don't sell records like we used to. So... I'm planning a trip in a couple of weeks' time, which is really how we generate cash for the label. Because obviously, recording, photographs, all the artwork takes a lot of money. So we need to generate cash. If we're not going to make sales, we have to figure a way out. So it's called non-sales income, this is. And, and it can, in the end, generate sales. So if I said to viewers and yourself a lot, sink, they probably wouldn't understand. They'd think the kitchen sink or the bathroom sink. Actually, sink is when you sync music and film together. And in Los Angeles, um, there's an amazing studio called Capital Studios, which is Capital Records and a very iconic building. Everybody in the world since Frank Sinatra, Ella Fitzgerald have recorded right up to now. Um, and I go there every year to a sync festival where we meet with probably two or three hundred supervisors that buy music for film, mm. TV. And if you, your viewers would probably know a show called, say, Grey's Anatomy. It's a typical American TV show. There's a lot of music in there. There's a lot of drama as they're wheeled in and out of the hospital. Well, if, if you get a theme tune to a show like a Coronation Street or EastEnders or any of those, you make money. But actually, all the way through a show, there is music. And nearly every show in the world has some kind of music on. Even the God Channel, any channel has some music. And that has to be paid for. So it's a way of generating income. So what we do, we go out, we meet all these supervisors, and we take out our music and say... They've got Grey's Anatomy and we'll be going to ABC, Disney, uh, Universal, all the major studios and saying, is the best of our music, would you put it in your show? Now, if you were in Grey's Anatomy or a show like that and your song was only played once, do you know you could earn about $30,000 from that, from one play in an American TV show? Because, of course, it's shown all around the yes. world. So I'm off to LA in a couple of weeks' time to a sync festival and... Uh, why don't you join me in Los Angeles? Sounds like a very good would you idea. Like, do you think we can have a word with the bosses? Let's have a word. Get an away day ticket. See if we could. See if we yeah. could. Yes. So we're nipping out for a couple of weeks. <laughs> now, seriously, if, you, if you'd love to come, I'd love yes. you to meet because you'll then see how it really works. Mm. We really make money from film, TV and commercials. And uh, the best place to do that is Los Angeles, California. Fantastic. Well, let's see what we can do. Okay. Wonderful. Have a word with the boss. Thank you. Thank you, Barry, for joining me. Thank, Thank you. you. Barry, welcome. Welcome, Monica. How are you? you I'm Los very Angeles? well. I'm absolutely brilliant. It's a wonderful city. And we're in this gorgeous British consulate. The British, we're in the British consulate here in Los Angeles. And I'm going to let you into a little secret. Tell us. I was born in 1957. They bought this in 1957 as a present for me. And it's just been given to me. <laughs> yeah, it's a famous architect so, <laughs> See? that built it. So, I'm in the presence it's a, yeah, of a well, great gorgeous, person. It's a gorgeous building. And obviously, we're here to talk about music and the music absolutely. industry. And, as a record label, which I've owned for 27 years, we make money in different ways now. We actually give music away to make money. But also, the main reason to be here, we're, I'm one of 43 record labels from the United Kingdom that actually is being honoured here tonight, and we've been welcomed by the Consulate General, and they've asked us to come along to this garden party. And I reckon outside there's around about three or 400 people, movers and shakers from the music business, film, TV, and the objective really is to get our music into film and TV. I mean, you're from the UK as, as I am, and all of the CSI shows and all of those, um, they're massive in the United Kingdom, and they all, they all have music. So uh, because we don't sell records anymore, because we don't sell anything in the, in the old fashioned way, we do try and get into film, TV, and commercials as well. You know, they're always very, very good. So even that really, to be fair, mm. the money has dried up, the money's probably 10% what it was 10 years ago. So the revenue has dropped, but the opportunities exist. And I'm very much into PR, as you know. Um, and I really believe one thing's important. If you're in a film, but you make no money, that's fine. Being in the film is perception. And of course, being in the film, if the film's popular, you then sell records, because people buy the downloads. So it's, it's about making money in two or three different ways. Now you said you know we're here because of the sync mission. Yeah. For those who don't know what the sync mission is, can you just briefly explain what that actually okay. is? Okay, well sync is where music and film uh, are joined together in over matrimony, as it were. Um, and of, of course, all sorts of music makes film. Everything, good and bad songs make films. So there's, as I say, there's 43 companies here. Um, we're all pitching different things. There's electronica, 
there's jazz. I mean, I think the first track I placed here last week was a jazz song, a 1930s jazz track that we got. So I sort of represent a lot of rock and dance music, but all genres are here. We're trying to get into the film and the TV, and it's about making contact. You're always good as contacts. And the same and I do have to praise, I really have to praise the British government and UKTI, not just for letting us use the building, which is great, but without them, these missions wouldn't happen. They fund a lot of it, they, you know, they hire Capitol Studios and Capitol Records uh, in LA. We're there every day for five days. We meet around about 200 delegates there, um, and they're, from, they're the cream of the crop from the film and TV industry. They are the best, there's no doubt about that. And you couldn't meet them in a week. You couldn't make appointments to meet them, so they come to us. You know, so um, it's about how to make money for music. Well, let's have a chat a little bit later on, but let's, have, let's just stop there for the moment, Barry, and see what other guests I can find to talk about. I'll introduce you to some of my friends, shall I? Absolutely. Thank you, Monica. Hello, so I'm now joined by Carlo Cavagna, Head of Trade and Investment. Hello, thank you so much for joining me. So, Carlo, can you just describe a little bit about what you do? Well, I run the UK Trade and Investment team in Los Angeles, and our purpose is twofold, to attract investment to the UK and to empower UK exporters overseas. It's all about business development for the UK. Fantastic. So what in your role, um, does it cover all industries, not just the music industry? Yes, my role does cover all industries. We have numerous priority sectors, areas of UK strength that we focus on in Los Angeles. Fantastic, but for this, for this particular documentary, obviously we're talking about the music industry. So let's focus on that, Carlo. So tell me a little bit about what you do and how you support the music, music industry. Well, we have a variety of initiatives designed to support the British music industry. And uh, they range from uh, large marketing initiatives to trade missions to one-to-one -one business development services. We have a large presence at South by Southwest, for example, uh, and the current SYNC mission here in Los Angeles right now is, I think, a very good example of one of the trade missions that we run. Yes, yeah, so tell us a little bit more about the SYNC mission. We're here in Los Angeles, California. Um, for people who don't know what that is, just tell us a little bit about what that actually is. The SYNC mission has been running for 11 years, since 2005 actually, although we've done 11 of them. And it, the purpose of the mission is to um, educate and connect British companies that are interested in providing music to visual media in the United States. That's film, that's television, video games, uh, adverts, and movie trailers. And the music could be licensed, it could be composed, it could be library. The mission covers all of these things. And uh, our goal is to educate the UK music companies that participate in the mission in how the business works and how music supervisors who make those creative decisions do their jobs. Because the more they understand about how it all works, the more they can engage into those relationships and those workflows in a productive way. And once we've educated them, we've also give them some connections. We, this, we have a networking event tonight. We have networking events all week. We introduce them to about 50 music supervisors over the course of a week of panels and presentations and even more uh, via our networking events. And the panels you have, I mean, they're very interesting people. They're very high-end vice presidents, presidents of very, very well-known companies. Is that important to you, that you have credible people that are going to give advice to the people that attend the SYNC Festival? It's very important that the people be credible and knowledgeable uh, and also generous and uh, willing to share their time and their expertise. We hope that they get something out of this as well. We hope that uh, they get music that they haven't heard before, that they will they are always seeking uh, new music. They need new music in order to do their jobs, in order to stay ahead of the curve and be on top of the latest trends. So we hope they get something out of it too. And the latest trends, Carla, the music industry is an ever-evolving, changing um, sphere. Is there anything that you particularly feel in your role that has changed quite dramatically in the music industry? Well, I think, well, the music industry has obviously has been changing dramatically for the past 10 or 15 years as it's tra transitioned away from physical media to digital. Um, and uh, piracy has been a problem and everyone is seeking the business models uh, in order to, uh, uh, to make money off the fact that people still consume music passionately, but they may not be buying it in the way that they were buying it before. And uh, I think the music industry is finding those business models now. Uh, there's subscription services available, 
um, live performance is doing very, very well. And of course, um, revenues from licensing and sponsorships are very good, and that's what this mission focuses on. And do you feel that the, the relationship between the US and the UK, as far as the music's concerned, you have a good relationship? I think it's the best relationship. Um, the relationship between the UK and the US in all the creative industries, and music uh, perhaps uh, most of all, um, is founded on collaboration and cooperation. Um, that's been the case for the last 53 years, going back to when uh, four kids from Liverpool uh, took music that uh, sailors um, and other travelers were bringing back to the UK that you couldn't hear on the radio and, uh, and made it their own and did something dramatically new with it. And ever since then, um, we've been kicking ideas back and forth and shaping every major popular music trend uh, in the world. Mm. And for the future for you, in your role, Carlo, what do you see? Do you see it ever changing still? Do you see a continual change in your role in what you do? Well, um, we will pivot um, according to where UK strengths are and according to where opportunity is here. Uh, the music industry has been a UK strength for decades, as I've mentioned, so I don't anticipate that changing. I think we'll continue trying to provide effective support in that area. Yes, thank you. Well, thank you so much for joining us today, and thank you very much for your time, Carlo. Sure. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. So I'm now joined by Tim Crouch, who's Vice Consul, Sector Lead, Creative and Media for the UK Trade and Investment here in the United States. So Tim, thank you so much. Welcome. So Tim, just tell us a little bit about your role and what it actually involves. So I, I lead the team in the United States that deals with all things film, TV, video games, music, animation, and a couple of other things that we broadly describe as the creative industries. And, and we're responsible partly for encouraging American companies to invest in the United Kingdom in those industries. And partly it's about helping British companies export whatever it is they do, whether it's what they produce or what they, what they market, into the United States. And the team is spread across different cities all, all across the United States. Yes, I was going to ask you that. This is not just here in Los Angeles, is it? Yeah, it that's is across right. the whole of the United States of America. Exactly. And how do people know about you back in the UK? So we're, we're lucky to have a, a, a good team uh, in place all the way across the United Kingdom. So, so we, we have UK trade and investment offices all across the different regions of England, plus we work closely with the, the Scottish Government, the Welsh Government and the Government in Northern Ireland. And when you're in your role, Tim, do you find it's quite a, an active role? I mean, do you get very, very busy in, in your role? I should imagine you do. Yeah, it's great. Uh, and and, and that's, that's one of the things that excites me about it. So I, I'm lucky enough to work across uh, actually what is quite a diverse set of industries. Uh, and, and as a result, I, I get involved in all sorts of interesting things. This, this obviously being a highlight with, with, this, with the Sync Mission in yes. Los Angeles. But it, you know, it, it could be in film one week, it, it could be in video games the next. And it, it's wonderful. And I mean, video games. I mean, that's we've seen a massive increase in in the video game industry. Is that a sector that you you feel you're actually putting more work and effort into? It is. It's it's, it's one of a handful of priority sectors for us. Uh, we're lucky enough in the UK to have a new tax credit that that just completely changes the the financial consideration for companies investing in the United Kingdom but it also lowers the cost base for British video game developers when they're exporting into international markets. So it's a real game changer. And are the British market do, do, doing very well here in the US as far as the video games is concerned? They are, and there, there's, there's some, some real highlights in, in different titles that, that the UK produces and exports in, in, into the United States. And the, the, the most famous one, of course, is Grand, the Grand Theft Auto series uh, done by Rockstar North out, out of Dundee. But there, there's a number of other examples that, that, are, that are wonderful. Uh, and, and I think it's, it's particularly telling that a number of the big US uh, publishers choose to have their European headquarters in the United Kingdom. I mean, I was just about to say that. I mean, don't, I don't think people realise that you know, Grand Theft Auto, if you've just said, was actually made in the UK. Yeah, that's right. Uh, you know, people assume it's it's in America. Yeah. So, in your role, do you ensure that the communication is there, that people know exactly where these games are made, who's you know who's put who's put it all together? Is that important to you, Tim? That people know exactly where it's coming from? Yeah, that's right. So, so in some ways, we're we're cultural ambassadors for the United Kingdom, marketing the things that, that the UK does really well. The Sync Mission is is a good example of that because music is such an important export but video games is, is also the, the, the same with film um, so we work very closely with the British Film Commission uh, who encourage production into the United Kingdom and, and we make sure that people are aware of what's shot in the United Kingdom so it's it's not just the the things that you you, you knew were shot there 
So things like The King's Speech is a quintessentially British film, but it's also The Avengers, Age of Ultron, which, which it doesn't come across as a British film, but is absolutely a result of British talent, British locations, British VFX, and a, and a good story to tell for the United Kingdom. And as far as the film industry is concerned, again, how is British music doing in, a, in, the, in the film industry here in the, in the United States? I think it will, it will all, always do well, partly because, uh, because you know, directors, music supervisors like the British sound. You know, the, the UK punch is well above its weight in, in, in sync licensing. Um, and as a result, you know, the UK will always, 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 I think, have a high profile. Uh, Why do you think that is, Tim? Is there a reason for that? Because we do, do, we do seem to do very well here from other countries, for instance. Why do you think that is? So I, th I think it's, it's a blend of the historic precedent. So, you know, you've had the British invasion and so on. And, you know, there's, there's such, a, such a strong feeling towards the back catalogue of British music. But it's also because British music moves with the times. And I think in, in many ways it's slightly ahead of the curve. So you think about what's going on in the United States with EDM, uh, you know, electronic dance music. Uh, and actually the UK is well ahead of the curve in, in terms of what's happening here. So, so that's made a, a real difference in the way that we're able to sell the UK because we are the trendsetters and, and that, that makes our job that much easier. And how do you stay ahead of the game? You know, why, what do you do, Tim, or can you actively do to encourage people to stay ahead of the game? Or do you see the trends as in your role itself? So I think in some ways our role, our role isn't to drive creative people, it's to facilitate creative people. So, so we're, we're there simply to give the amazing creative talent that the UK has the platform they need to sell into the US. So I don't think, I don't think we actually get that involved in, create, in promoting the actual creativity, because that's there anyway. We're all about giving it the perfect platform to sell into the United States. And how do you see the future, Tim, for the British industry here in the US? How do you see that? I'm, I'm, I'm confident, uh, and, and, and it's part of my job to be confident, but, but I, you know, I come to work each day and feel very positive about the, the, the creativity that we have in the United Kingdom. And, and that's right the way across, you know, whether it be advertising, whether it be animation. You, know, you, you think about what the UK brought you in, in, in animation, for example, and we're the home of Wallace and Gromit. Yes. You know, just this amazing worldwide brand uh, that continues to adapt. Uh, and, and still has, has such a sort of strong feeling that, uh, that, that people have such affection. So I, I'm, I'm very confident yeah, the future looks good. Oh, that's great. Well, Tim, thank you so much for joining yeah. us. It's been an absolute pleasure. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, well, thank you for joining me in California. I'm really grateful to Big Centre Television and Copper TV for doing this. I'd like to take you on an interesting journey this week, if I may. Um, we're going to go across to Capitol Studios, which is the home of so many big names. And I was in the building um, a few days ago and we were talking about just a rostrum that was sat in the studio. And that rostrum has been there since Frank Sinatra was one of the first artists ever to record. And Nat King Cole and Ella Fitzgerald, and that's still there today. So the, the building has amazing history. We're doing a conference all week with a lot of delegates from the UK. Um, only about 43 record companies have been invited on this, all, all United Kingdom record labels. And what I'll do during the course of the week, if I may, is take you along to the British Consulate. There's a garden party in our honour being held there. Get to talk to some of my friends and colleagues about what they're doing. We all, we all do things slightly different. I mean, I'm very much a PR person and I always look at the value of the story as well as the value of the sale. Because the sale is a one-off fee. It's gone. It's, it's, it's a finite figure. The story can run and run and run. So I, I'm probably the maverick in the building. Um, so I'll get some of my friends to tell you what they do, but primarily I'm here because we've lost the licensing opportunities that existed. We used to license, you know, I could have one song licensed on 10 different compilations in Japan the same week because they were non-exclusive licenses. It'd be dance compilations, dance now, top dance 40 and all of those things. So um, that's all gone now with iTunes, you know, because people can download anything anywhere in the world quite easily. So we look for other ways of revenue. and. We went through quite a big phase about five, ten to five, ten years ago in the UK. Newspapers, I don't know if you remember, were always giving away a free CD. They were called premium CDs. And of course, um, you bought your Daily Mail or The Sun, and you got a free CD of Elvis live in Memphis or, you know, Mud's Greatest Hits or the best of Elvis Costello. And these were recordings that already existed. 
they existed in a place, a record company vault like mine. And what the newspaper would do, would pay the record company to use the rights, in, in similar to licensing that we talked about earlier. They would then manufacture probably 100,000 CDs, maybe more. They would then distribute them with the newspaper. Now, we had a mechanical copyright, which is MCPS. So each time a physical CD was pressed, eight pence went to the writer of the song. It's called a, a mechanical copyright. So that happened, and that was one way of uh, getting revenue. So that was a very big phase for about five years, and we were all really pushing hard at the newspapers to get them to take our latest album and stuff. So that was a revenue stream. The main aim of me being in Los Angeles this week is to try and get my tracks into film, TV, commercials. I'm, I'm visiting Disney, uh, Studios, ABT, ABC Television, Universal, uh, a really big advertising agency called BLT Communications. So I'll be doing that during this week, and hopefully you'll share some of that with us. There'll be some, uh, you know, like some of the big studios won't want us to film there, you know, that they've got their sort of reasons. So we'll get you into as much as we can. We'll get you to have a look, meet as many people as you can, and we'll try and show you how, as a record label, we continue to try, and try very, very hard to get money for our artists. Fantastic. Let's go. Let's go do it. I'm now joined by Denise Williams, singer-songwriter, four-time Grammy Award winner. Denise, it's a pleasure to have you here. Oh, thank um, you. Denise, I want to speak to you about the music industry. You've been in the music industry for many years, worked with so many wonderful artists. Tell us about how you feel it's changed during those course of years. Well, the music uh, industry as I knew it and the music industry, the model that I came up under and was successful no longer exists. Our industry has changed quite a bit and of course, if you don't go with the flow of things, you can be kind of get left behind. Mm -hmm. And I mean, we did, uh, when I started our recording, in the studio with live musicians, analog, now you have digital, you have, you know, the downloads, we recorded vinyl, you know, album covers. Uh, we went to record stores and promoted the product. And none of that exists now. I mean, for some of the young, they've never actually seen a record. They don't even know what a vinyl is. Um, do you feel that you know things have moved on in a good way, Denise? Or do you feel sometimes that the the progress that we've made in the industry could actually be seen as we're going back backwards? How do you see it? Well, you know what? When I was growing up and listening to my mom's records and singing by those records, and then. Uh, a couple of people after that generation started making records and they didn't like the music and they thought everything has changed. What I've come to know is that the industry with everything else like life is cyclical and there are various things that happen at a certain time and then we outgrow that and we move forward. So unfortunate I think on a lot of levels it's progressed into a different kind of cycle that probably my generation number one doesn't understand and doesn't like it. And I, you know, I understand that but, uh, it's changed. You know, people are selling through uh, Cloud, Spotify, you know, Apple Music, all of these different things that my generation, we just don't understand what's going on. The thing that's saving a lot of us is that we have young children that are running our careers that's now right. <laughs> and that are helping us along to understand the new way to get music out to uh, publish your music, to get your music out to people. The model, like I said, that I was successful in no longer exists. So it's kind of an, an anomaly, you know, kind of like a really weird mystery to me. But because of my children in, in their 20s, you know, they're saying, Mom, you got to do this and you've got to do that. And so I've kind of uh, passed the torch over to them to let them handle it. And it's incredible the way people are now making money through the music industry, but it's quite different and it's to someone like me, it's a little scary. Do you think it's tougher? I think that it's tougher uh, in as much as when I was on radio and with my peers, if you heard a Patty Austin record, you knew it was Patty Austin. If you knew, if you heard uh, an Aretha Franklin, you know it was Aretha Franklin, came a little before me. Gladys Knight was on, you knew it was Gladys Knight. Diana Ross, you knew it was Diana Ross. And these days, everybody sounds alike to me. And I think also what is missing a lot is the performances because a lot of people cannot get on stage and duplicate what's been, um, what can I say, made in the studio because it's not the same. It's the, uh, unfortunately, it's the Milli Vanilli syndrome where you get people in there and they really don't have the musical background to do what they've done in the studio to produce it on stage. So now we don't have a lot of performers 
as we had before. I mean, we used to go out there and have fun, you know, and you, I mean, some people would come off stage and you kind of let it simmer for a minute, throw some water on it because their performances were so great. Well, we don't have those kind of performances anymore I mean, because the talent's not there. Yeah, I mean, the songs that you've done, I mean, particularly Let's Hear It For The Boy, for instance, which was used in the film Footloose, wasn't it? Yes. Now that's actually, is that not being made again? Is that being used again in the, in the newer version of Footloose? Is that right? It was used in the newer version of Footloose and that was really, that was just incredible because you think, okay, they're doing this new thing they're going to re-record everything but my version from the first Footloose ended up in that film and that that was quite a you know a little kudos for me I mean I think that they gave me an honorable kind of a mention and I felt so great about that it's wonderful to see that music recorded 10 20 years ago I mean 30 even longer than that still being used in you know the present day music industry is that important to you as well Denise to see that the old star music is still going to be used here in you know 2015 I think that it's incredible that our music is still being used and recorded uh, I get sampled quite a bit I think the last time uh, someone did do one of my songs was probably Monica about four years ago but Seal has recorded the songs I've had about on free alone I've had about 35 covers mm -hmm. on one song and it's it's really great for me because I had no idea the music would have that kind of a life um, that it would still be around 38 years since I first recorded it, but it's still here. And I think, um, I love it because what it says is that even though we're a generation that you don't hear a lot of us as, we, as you used to in, in some days past, but that the younger artists who are unfortunately not songwriters the way we were, are using our, our songs and making samples out of them. And, I'm thankful for that. My grandchildren love that. I mean, yeah. thank you so much. The baby needs shoes and they still getting them. So <laughs> it's all good. It's all good. It's all good. I mean, as a soul funk artist, um, do you feel that your genre of music is really being heard now in the 21st century? Do you feel that there's, a, there's somebody you can think of yourself that's really taken that music into another level, really? Or do you feel, again, we're still relying on older artists that have been around for many years? still coming through what, what's your opinion on that well there are some people that are really doing it when I look at uh, Bruno Mars I, I think he is so incredibly talented and it's his live musicians he's got the James Brown horns you know and the Phoenix horns the earth wind and fire he's a combination of a lot of people and I think he's a consummate artist and certainly he is the artist of today so when you look at someone like Bruno Mars, it's still there and they're taking it to another level beyond even what some of us did. So I, I find it incredible and we do have those gems every now and then that pop up. And for you as an artist, how are you going to take your music forward, Denise? What, what are you going to do to make sure that you can be still be heard and still respected for your you know, amazing career that you've had already? But for the future, how are you going to make sure that you're still going to be heard and people are still going to love you? Well, it's very interesting because, like I said, I've been in this industry for 38 years and yet I'm still touring. People still want to come to the concerts and hear me and I get the $64 million question, when are you going in the studio and doing more music? And not only from my generation, but the younger artists that say, well, my mom used to listen to you, are you doing so and so? So I am working on a new project, which is a jazz project. And that's probably one of the few genres that's left that I desire to do. I mean, I've been successful, thank God, I've been successful in the pop field, in the R&B field, and in the gospel field. Um, so now my whole desire is to do this in phenomenal jazz um, uh, CD project. And I'm finding it very exciting. I'm drawing on some of the people that I grew up listening to, Little Jimmy Scott, Nancy Wilson, Cleo Lane. I'm just excited to do this because when at the end of the day I am an artist and and artists think differently than anybody else anybody else yes. there you go <laughs> <laughs> I, I love the art side yeah. of it you know and so I'm not willing to and have never been willing just to do a CD if they thought this was a great song if I didn't feel it if it wasn't something I could take someone else on the journey with me I I passed it up. I've given a lot of songs that were hits for other people away because it wasn't me. So I found out that I am an artist, but this project I think is going to be incredible. I think a lot of people are going to be happy to hear it and hear the other incredible musicians that 
have agreed to be a part of this with me. That's great. Well, Denise, it's been a pleasure to speak to you. Thank you so much for joining me. And I'll speak to you again soon. Thank you. Yep, we will. You're welcome. Thank you. So I'm now joined by David Foreman of Foreman Brothers. David, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you. We're talking about the music industry. Um, you, want, you know Barry, of course, from, from Gotham Records. So yep. just tell us a little bit about what you do. Presently, our company does a lot of music licensing, film, advertising, television, games, reading cards, as well as we manage a, a nice little publishing company and we also are very much involved with neighboring rights. And David, do you find that the music industry, you've been in the music industry for, for a long time, how many years have you been involved with the music industry? Uh, I mean that in the nicest way. <laughs> in the nicest way, 42 years. 42 years. So I should imagine you've seen some changes from when you first started out to where... Well, before that, I was in the music conservatory and played yeah. in bands and all that. Too. Fantastic. So you've yeah. got the artist side as well as the oh, other yes, side yeah. as well. So, I can read music. Fantastic. <laughs> so, David, how has it changed? Do you think it has changed at all? Oh, it's definitely changed. Everything evolves. And um, I don't want to say it cannibalizes itself, but it has changed and it has evolved mm -hmm. quite a bit. And do you embrace that change? Well, you have, kind of have no choice but to embrace it. Um, it has changed quite a bit. When I started off, the single, the 45, was very important, which helped to sell an album. And the albums where the companies made money. And then new configurations were introduced, like the 8-track and the cassette tape. And then after a while, the CD. And then it went to... Uh, down digital downloads and then from digital downloads it's to subscription service for people that actually don't own anything so I mean, yes it has changed it has evolved quite a bit into a whole new um, way of doing things and how do you as a company keep up with that change I really don't keep up with it that much because I really don't have to uh, in licensing we have music for film, for advertising, for, for TV, for whatever medium might need it, webisodes, whatever. We have music for those uh, mediums. So it works great for us. Am I concerned about selling it or having a, a, a subscription? No. It's very important for the artist. But now, as opposed to making money, for an artist, as opposed, uh, as opposed to making money on s sales of recordings or downloads groups are making more money when they're touring mm -hmm. and all that that's what it seems like that's what it seems like to you so it be, then you have touring and then along with the touring comes the merchandising and whatever else that goes along yeah there's a lot of sort of emphasis put on the merchandising now isn't it for groups and bands it, and because that's where the money comes from it's um, one of the places it's yes. one of the places absolutely and and where else would you say that there the money actually comes from now for particularly for independent record labels for instance where where and how do, can they make their money well with the advent of online music video platforms such as a Vimeo or a YouTube or Facebook whatever um, comes advertising possibilities of advertising revenue that's one way they're being British um, neighboring rights is a big way to make money as well mm. now so just explain that David for those who don't quite understand neighboring rights what does that actually mean neighboring rights was it's called the Rome Convention of 1961, where the entire world pretty much signed on to give a royalty to the performers. Uh, I used to tease people and call it a, a George Ringo royalty, as opposed to Lennon McCartney, um, where the musicians actually get paid as well. So unlike publishing, where the songwriters and the publishers make money, on neighboring rights, the musicians and the master owners make money as well. So um, there is money to be made for neighboring rights. And that's what's great, one great thing about the British marketplace. 
because they can collect from around the world. The U.S. might be a problem. They're trying to change it here. But when neighboring rights was started in 1961, and it's been ratified over the years, and been people jumping on board, uh, there's a few countries that never signed up, U.S. being one of them. Why was that, um, David, do you think? Why, why did the U.S. not sign up to that? Because they felt they were going to be giving more money out than bringing in. And they were wrong. <laughs> but they, they hold you know, to it. It's starting to change, though. I was so going to say, is it something they would like to change, perhaps? Would they be signing up? Well, it that? depends who you're talking to. The broadcasters will say no. <laughs> they like it the way it is. But what's fair to the musician and the master owners is, yes, it does change. If radio is playing music, it should be. They should pay for it. Not much, like they're paying for publishing. They should pay for the musicians that are, and the master owners. So how do you see your company evolve? You've been, your company's been established for how many years? Our company is going on 20 years. I mean, I was doing other things leading up to this, but yes. And how do you see that, your <clears throat> company evolving, David? What, how do you see the future of Foreman Brothers? Well, I have to look, to, to see the future, I have to look at the past, because a lot of things we just fall into. Good answer. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. That's true. So basically, it started off as being called upon from a company in Italy to represent a Luciano Pavarotti uh, package. It actually was his recording debut. And I don't know much about the opera world. I never really had a, much of a taste for it, to be honest with you. But I was asked to see if we can help broker it. So I put together the figures, the numbers, this and that. And but before I can go shop it around, I realized at that time, Pavarotti was going through a, a pretty heavy duty divorce. So the last thing you want to do is when you're selling something and it's sold, that it's, there's a, a block from the attorneys representing to the wife's, you know, and yes. this and that, mm -hmm. and bringing all these people into a major quagmire that, you know, a headache galore. So I had to make sure everything would be legit. And I did that, and then I got all this documentation written in Italian, and I had to translate it to make sure everything was on the up and up. And we did that. And um, so that worked out pretty nice. Mm -hmm. And then... Um, what happened there was, I was pitching here and pitching there, and I thought I had a few deals, and then something came out of the blue, and some company wanted to buy another company out of Italy. So they came from Italy to California, back to Italy, and we sold it, and it was another broker, actually. And he wouldn't tell me who it was sold to. And, okay, well, we did the deal. And then I ran into him like six, seven months later in France. I said, <laughs> it's out of curiosity. And it was enough time had passed and it was Pavarotti brought it back. He just wanted it off the market. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I have two copies left. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, it's, it's, now you're here, obviously based in LA, your company's based right. in Los Angeles, but you, presumably you work all, over, all across the world? Yes. And is there any particular country where you work more, where you see the music perhaps progressing more? Is it the UK or is it any other country? Is Actually, the, the whole world, you know, you'd be surprised. The whole world is really doing well. I think for the Pacific Rim, the country to look out for is really South Korea. Amazing. Um, I knew that leading up to Gangnam style. Um, the UK is a very special market because UK, there's something in the water there that this the creativity comes out of people, uh, their interpretation of music as, as we've witnessed from the 60s on, to new kinds of music. Um, so the UK is very special, Canada is very special as well. Um, I do things in different parts of the world, like South America, there's certain parts of Brazil that are really coming around, Argentinian rock is something special for me as well. So really, it is a global It's a global market. thing, but my heart and soul would be in Canada and in England. Um, and, and that's why I'm real fortunate with working with a company like Gotham Records, because, God, this company's got, you know, I don't know if it is what it is, but it's, just, it's exactly what I want. Yeah. <laughs> and it's not just one genre of music. Now, we did this thing with Gotham for an artist, uh, it was a country record. Um, I believe the fellow's name was Luke Guy Reed. And for me it was amazing because 
years ago, I had worked at RCA Records in the U.S. as a Western Regional Director of Promotion, and one of our artists was Waylon Jennings. Here is a reincarnate, <laughs> Luke Guy Reed, and who would know? Isle of Isle of Man, I think he came from, yes. and it's amazing. So we worked hard. I met with with Barry, who we've had a relationship with over at Gotham, and next thing you know, it's in a movie called 50 to 1. I believe it's 50 to 1. No, it's, no, it's, no, it's a different title. It's, we got to get out of this place and they change it to another, oh, right. another title. Mm -hmm. So, um, but it's a tremendous artist. And he's terrific. Um, there's a few other acts that Barry has turned me on to. So Barry seems to have his finger on the pulse that I like. I mean, there's different types of music. But he seems to know what works for which people, you know, and Excellent. so that's what makes it special. Thank you. Well, that's been a pleasure to speak to you, David. Thank, Thank you, you so, so much. much. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right. Gotham Records is an independent label based out of the UK, but actually we um, we release records all over the world. I've had partners in the Middle East as well as here in America and right across Europe and South Africa. Uh, and even Israel, so uh, you know we're kind of a global company, although we're based in Birmingham, in the United Kingdom. Um, I started the label really by accident. Um, I already managed artists way back in the early 80s, and I'd been uh, managing artists. We'd had record deals with EMI, RCA, Virgin Records, V2, BMG. So we'd had record deals with all the big labels, and I just got very, very despondent with the way they operated. It was all very big and it was very boom time and we used to get £25,000 maybe advance for a single. Uh, you'd be lucky to get that these days for an album. But it was big money and it was big time. However, um, as an artist manager I realised that there's a lot of small things in the world that do well too. Um, you know, you throw tiny little grass seeds down on the grass, they're tiny little grass seeds but they turn into an amazing beautiful green lawn when they grow. So. I wanted to do a lot of things organically and in small ways that would develop around the world. And I found that the record labels, the majors, wouldn't allow me to do that. So um, I decided I'm going to start my own record label. I don't know what it means. I don't know what the journey will take me. And I certainly don't know if I'll make any money from it, but I think I'm going to do that anyway. So, so I did that right back in 1988. And uh, 27 years later, uh, we're changing the way we operate as a record label. but. Uh, we're still in business and uh, I love having a record label, it's my very own jukebox. I set about my new record label, Gotham Records. We owned a few tracks that we'd recorded, but really we had got to record stuff because we were now a record label, so we started looking for stuff to license. And very, very quickly, because it was the end of the 80s, dance music was very, very big. So when I set up the label, I set it up kind of as a, a rebellion against the majors, but I didn't quite know what I was going to do with it. I, I, to be fair, I didn't know, you know. Um, I didn't even have a name, somebody else suggested the name Gotham, which stuck and it's lasted us really well. But uh, I very, very quickly realised dance music, which I wasn't a fan of and I'm not really a fan of, was, was popular. So if we could perhaps license some dance music cheap or free or record some inexpensive dance tracks, then sell them, maybe that would be a way of making money and that's exactly what we did. And who were the big record labels around at the time? It, well, we just had a, a track satellites with Ellie Warren with EMI, which of course is a major, major label. Virgin had a label called V2, and we'd had a, a big record out with them. Um, and there was RCA um, and BMG with the big one, and London Records. We'd had a record out with London Records, so they were the big labels, and uh, you know they, they're big, big deals, and they paid a lot of money, you know. They, but they did hideous things like they would have a beautiful office in London right by one of the best recording studios in the world and they would fly to Canada to do a vocal and of course the artist would say this is brilliant this is brilliant I'd say it's not actually because you're paying for it what a lot of artists never realized and still don't really to, to this day that when you're getting put on a plane or in a limousine or you've got four minders you're actually paying for it it's very true not yeah. many people will probably think about that no. they'll think that the record company yeah. But, well, they do, but of course, uh, if you go on to make money, and you don't always go on to make money, and there's a lot of artists that never recoup their earnings, but if you go on to make money, um, then all of those costs are recouped from your earnings. So the only good thing about a record company, um, and I'll say this as a record company, it's not a good thing for a record company, is we loan people money without a guarantee. And if it doesn't work, they don't have to pay us back. So we're kind of a funny bank, really. 
Uh, you go to a bank and you say, I want to borrow £30,000, I want to record an album. They'll want your life story, your history, some, some of your blood, your DNA. You'll go and record an album. It won't sell any. You'll lose £30,000. The bank will still want their money back because they gave you a loan as a risk. I don't suppose With, many people look at it like that. That's no, but that's actually how it works. And a lot of people complain about record companies, but we, we put up £100,000 to do an album. We take all the risk promoting the album. If the album then makes £200,000, we recoup the first £100,000 and then the second £100,000 that becomes profit, we then share with the artist. The artist may get a royalty typically of 10 to 17% maybe. I mean, Michael Jackson used to get about 20, 21. The average is probably 8 to 10%. So we, of course, would go on and make 90% of the profit, but of course we took 100% of the risks. If the album cost £100,000 and didn't make any money, we lost the £100,000. In the contract, the clause would say it's a recoupable but non-returnable advance which meant we will advance you at 30,000, 50,000 or 100,000 pound. If it makes money, we recoup it. If it doesn't, you don't return it. And a lot of people never respected that. And wouldn't you love a bank like that? Absolutely. And is it still the same method now as it was then? It's the same method, but you don't, I mean, typically um, a couple of the singles I had out on major record labels in 1984, 85, we were getting 25 and 30,000 pound advance for one single one single you could get a quarter of a million pound for an album maybe more now you'd be lucky to get £25,000 for an album they're more split deals you know the record company will pay the costs they'll recoup the cost but they'll do a 50-50 deal with you um, so and, and 360 deals have kicked in where oh, when I well, a 360 deal when I first started um, as a record label it was illegal for the record label to manage the artist because of the conflict of interest so that was illegal you had to have a manager that didn't own the record label. Now you have a 360 deal. Because all the revenue's gone, I, from 1988 to about 1997, so about 10 years I would say, we made a fortune from dance records, which I never liked, I didn't enjoy. We made an absolute fortune. We once made 47,000 pounds from a non-hit dance record by selling it all over the world. Well, that's a lot of money. What year was that? 1997. Yeah, it's a lot of money, but um, where the 360 deal kicks in, all of that licensing money's now gone. iTunes has appeared, uh, the internet's appeared, uh, Spotify, they all now exist where you can get the music for free. And um, they're a good thing because they promote the music, but they're a bad thing because they have stolen the, the, the obvious revenue, is you make something, you sell it. That's the obvious revenue. Join me next week as we continue talking to Barry and even more guests come to join us on our journey behind the scenes with Gotham Records.